ago. Um, so now that that's out of the way, we can record. Uh, okay, so let's say that. Okay, I'm going to launch a poll, and you guys tell me. C and D are obviously useless options, um, but A is yeah, you've done calc before. B is you've never seen a derivative. You have no idea what that means. And again, the the outcomes of this poll mean absolutely nothing. I'm obviously going to we're going to start from absolutely from scratch. So if you haven't seen it before, it doesn't matter if 99% of the class say yes, I've seen it, and you know one of you says no, I I've never seen this before. We're going to start from scratch and we're going to do it all over. So I don't want you to worry about that. The outcomes don't make any difference in terms of you know, how we're going to do the teaching and presentation of it. I just kind of want an idea of, of roughly where everyone is at. Um, did I miss anything in the vids? Are we not doing all of probability? Yeah, we're not going to do the last part of the application. It would be really cool. And if you want to read about Markov chains yourself, that's something you can totally do. Markov chains super important in real life, especially when you're doing any sort of modeling. Um, and it's, it's a nice application of both probability and linear algebra. So if you want to check that out, it's super cool um, and you can totally do that. Um, but we're not going to test it. We're not going to examine it. But like I said, check out Markov Chains if you're interested. It's a pretty quick read um, and super important. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're going to do, we're going into calc. And of course, calculus is really the study of functions. And so we're going to study functions from the real numbers to the real numbers, at least at first. And then as we go on a little bit later in the term, we're going to start studying multivariate functions. So functions that can take in more than one number, but still only produce a single number uh, as output. Okay, so that's kind of the roadmap for where it is that we're going. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Last year, um, I don't know about last semester. I assume you meant last year. Last year, I don't know. They, we didn't have a super great year. I'm not 100% what happened, but it doesn't matter about last year as long as you guys love me this year, right? That's all that matters. Um, okay, so <laughs> that's that's our goal. All right, let me show you this polling. I mean, yeah, I caught a lot of students cheating for sure. Um, and like I said, you know what, everyone, I want to say I haven't made the test. Let me show you the poll results. I haven't made the test more difficult than I did last year, for example. But you guys have significantly outperformed those students, right? Like you guys have um, probably on average done 20% better on all of your tests than those students did on the exact on, on the same level of difficulty tests. So students, um, yes, you do see Christmas lights. Students, um, it seemed to be, they were really angry that I refused to adjust those tests, but it was because I was like, these are the same tests we do every year. You guys are doing really poorly. We're, we haven't changed how we're teaching. I don't know what's going on, but I refused to adjust those tests. And so a lot of them got really, really angry with me. Like 20 percentage points, like, where this class would average 68, the last year's class would average 48, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. So I'll say, Jude, there's definitely an, a natural ebb and flow where some years you get a really strong group of students and some years you get a really weak group of students. And of course, that's a statistical average. It doesn't mean that you know people from last year on average uh, or any individual was less strong than any of you. But I think they were just overall a weaker group and you guys are a stronger group than they are. Um, but because I refused to change the marks because it was the same test, they really got angry at that and uh, they let me know. So um, that was that. Um, okay, so it seems like a good chunk of you have seen some differential calculus before, um, and that's good. Um, but for those of you who have it, I don't want you to worry about it at all. And for those of you who answered C, I have no idea what you're doing. But for those of you who haven't at all, don't worry about it. We're going to introduce it absolutely from scratch. We're not going to go any more quickly than we would because you know three quarters of the class have seen it before. We're going to assume that everyone is kind of at the same level. What that also means uh, is that we are not going to, um, as some of you will be tempted to use techniques that you have learned in high school that we didn't necessarily teach you. I think it would be a good idea for you to talk to me about those techniques. My rule is always you're allowed to use other things. Okay, I'm never going to um, punish you for knowing more than you should. But the rule is, is that if you use, and I, I want to make this very, very clear, if you ever use a technique that is not a technique that we have done in this class, you have to be 100% correct. Okay, because, you know, when I uh, give you a test question, and when we give you test questions, we're trying to assess how well you've learned the material that we've taught you. So if you use a method that we haven't taught you, we are incapable of doing that. And like I said, I'm not going to punish you, but the rule then is you're allowed to use those techniques, but you have to be 100% correct in how you use those techniques. Okay. 
So things like L'Hopital's rule, for those of you who know it, uh, we're not going to do L'Hopital. If you want to use it, you can, but you got to be 100% certain that what you've done is correct. Because if you're incorrect, you've used an invalid technique and got a wrong answer, and that's going to nullify your results. Okay, so that's just kind of the fair warning. Those things are fair game, but they're kind of high risk, high reward. Okay, so just kind of keep that, um, keep that uh, in mind. Okay, yeah, and Adam, definitely, that's kind of like always the safe thing is if you just do, you know, what I show you, then you'll kind of be okay. Um, okay, so let's start off a little bit. We're just going to do some function stuff. Okay, a lot of this stuff I think should be review. Uh, I don't know what year it necessarily would have been, but no, 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 Jordan. Yeah, it has, is next week. Yeah, yeah, not this week, next week, not this week, next week. All right, so let's give this off. Um, what is this? When do you guys learn about functions first? Is that like grade 10-ish? Obviously, everyone comes from different systems, but um, okay, so we got a grade 11. So somewhere in there, right? OK, yeah, so pretty consistently, it seems like grade 11 is where you guys would have learned about that. So this is some, I, and you guys probably learned about function composition at that time. Um, OK, well, when did you learn about composition? Though? Would that have been advanced functions? I think that would have been grade 12. Oh, OK, OK. All right, so this is review then. but So it's still review, but it's like more recent review. There's a little bit to work out here. I'm very impressed that some of you managed to get this so quickly. I definitely had to write it down and work it out. It depends what you mean by graphing. I mean, like, I hate curve sketching. And Jordan, I think, will can confirm that for you. I've been bemoaning it for years. Oh, yeah, no, we're not going to do curve sketching. And there's still going to be some, you know, how, what does the derivative tell you about the shape of the graph? You know, stuff like that will come up. But curve sketching, as much as it's a nice pedagogical tool, is not terribly useful, and I personally hate it. Um, so I think you're probably OK. You don't have to worry about that. I will say, though, that I guess specifically in the integral calculus part, this is a bit ahead, um, being able to quickly sketch out um, a, a function or two will help you visualize the kind of stuff that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's actually a great point, especially like when we're doing like the area between curves and stuff is probably what you mean, Jordan, is like having yeah. a, a rough qualitative idea of what a function looks like will definitely help. But I don't think we're going to do anything like x over x squared plus 1, right? I think it's usually like uh, you should know what x squared looks like and x cubed and you know stuff like that. Like have a good idea of, of what the basic functions look like. Increasing and decreasing is definitely going to come up. So yeah, we are going to talk about that. You do have to know that sort of stuff, but you're not going to use it to plot a, a curve. Traditionally, we've often done stuff like here is a function, and I'll give you the graph, and you can tell me like where its derivative is positive or something. You have to be able to look at the graph, see where it's increasing, and then know the relationship between increasing and the derivative sort of thing. OK, so we're at about 76%, and we're still waiting on about 32, 36 people. Um, so let's get those last couple votes in. Give you 30 seconds or so. Okay, so I'm going to call it right here and share the results. Okay, so we're definitely leaning towards D. We've got a couple of A's, got a couple of B's, and a couple of C's. Uh, let's work this out. Let's see what we get. So consensus does seem to be on D. D is the correct answer. At least it's what I got. Um, but let's run through it nice and quick and see, just so we're all on the same page. And again, my setup here is a little bit different, so hopefully I can just sort this out a little bit loud to begin with. All right, so what do we have? We have f of x is the function x squared. All 
All right, we've got g of x is x plus one. Okay, so we want to compute g compose f compose g. Okay, now the great thing is you can compute that in any order. So if you want to do the g compose f on the left-hand side first, or the f compose g on the right-hand side first, you can do any of them. G of f of g of x. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the same thing. So um, let's compute. Let like don't try to do it all at once. You're probably more likely to run into some issues. Let's do it kind of one at a time. So I'm going to compute f compose g first, right? And remember, so that's f of g of x, right? And so everywhere where I see an x in the function f, I'm going to put g of x instead. So in that case, I'm going to get g of x all squared, right? Because the function f is f of x equals x squared. So f of g of x is then g of x squared. And we know what g of x is, so I can plug that in. That's x plus 1 squared. And if you want to, you can write this out. You can expand it out if you want to at this point. That's x squared plus 2x plus 1. OK, well, we've only done half of it. right? We've only done that part, f compose g. So now I need to do the other half of the composition, right? I need to do g compose f compose g. So let's do that. So g compose f compose g of x. So now I've already computed this, and I know that that part is x squared plus 2x plus 1. So I'm going to plug that now into g of x like that. And that's going to give me x squared plus 2x plus 2. Okay, And that was that's what d was. All right, so does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? OK, so I'm going to assume that's all OK, um, and that everyone is more or less fine if that worked. Can I please repeat what I did? So easy, where's the <laughs> We'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. So the key to doing composition, right? Maybe let's quickly do something a little bit harder. So let's say something I had, something like f of x is equal to x over x squared plus 1. And then I had g of x is equal to e of x, right? So when I do the composition, if I do f of g of x, so remember, this x here is just a placeholder, right? So it says, wherever I see. If I put a 2 here, then everywhere I see an x over here, I'm going to put a 2 as well. right? So when I do f of g of x, and I, I'm now going to put everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put a g of x. right? So I'm going to get g of x over g of x squared plus 1. And then I know what g of x is. It's actually e to the x. So I would get e to the x over e to the 2x plus 1 like that. right? So yeah, so f compose g, I kind of did that half first, right? I did this part first. I just wanted to compute that. And that was the x, oops, the x squared plus 2x plus 1. And then I'm doing g compose that, right? So if you want, maybe let me write that as g of x squared plus 2x plus 1, right? That right there is f compose g. And so everywhere I see an x in g of x, I'm going to replace it with x squared plus 2x plus 1. And when I do that, right, because g of x is just the function x plus 1, so I get x squared plus 2x plus 1, all plus 1, and that's going to give me my final answer. What does the 2 represent? Like this 2? Oh, oh, oh sorry, these 2s. Those 2s are just like me saying, oh, if I plug in a number there, if, like in for x, then how do you actually evaluate the function? Well, everywhere you see an x on the right-hand side, you plug that in, right? So you know, the 2 was just like, oh, if I were evaluating this function at 2. But I could have done something like, oh, let me evaluate this function at you know, um, happy face, right? And that gives me happy face divided by happy face squared plus 1. All right? So it's just, it's, it's just a placeholder, right? That's all that x is. So amount of f compose g is f of g of x, right? f compose g of x. 
means that you plug g of x into f, right? You actually take g and you plug it into f of x. OK. All right, everyone's OK? And yeah, Jordan, that's a nice question. I like that. OK, let's try another one. Let me see what do I want to do here. Ooh, let's try that. What don't you like, sir? Probably how sadistic your tone was. <laughs> <laughs> I like to search the questions. Wow, some of you guys answered that real quick. Way to go. No, I no one's talking right now. It's just my my laptop's going. Uh, the fan is going hard because Zoom just murders everything. The moment I share a screen, you know, I swear I can run most games on my laptop, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't run this hot. Uh, Zoom is just absolutely a resource hog. It's nuts. That's right. You know, I've got a friend who is a developer and a lot of what they do uh, runs client side, right? So instead of doing the computations on the server and then sending the results to the browser, the browser actually does the, the computations. And so they were in like an investor meeting and said they were trying to show the investors what was going on by screen sharing. And investors were like, Zoom was taking up so many resources that their website didn't work. Um, it was just, it was consuming so much. It was absolutely insane. Um, Daniel, I'm not, so I actually have two things going on, right? There's my laptop, which is, you know, a pretty sweet laptop, which I, I, I absolutely love, but I do also have my surface. Um, the surface is what I draw on, right? But like, you'll be able to, sorry, this might be a little bit loud. So my surface is separate, right? So that's why you can kind of see me switch screens when I jump over to, um, my written explanation because I'm sharing on one computer and then I write on the other. Yeah, it's, and when you share screens, it, it really takes off, right? Like Zoom is, so I can definitely get Zoom working pretty decently on my like 12 year old laptop because um, I have another one which I keep on the side. Um, and so when I, for example, when we're doing Dungeons and Dragons, I'll like play my music through that laptop. So I, I join it to the session and play music through that. But screen sharing is a different beast. For whatever reason, that takes up so many, so many resources. Um, yeah, 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 that was, that was a fun and interesting one. Uh, on this laptop, I've got 16 gigs and I think the Surface is eight. Yeah, I really like my Surface. Now, like that being said, by the way, we're at 80% of everyone. So let's do 30 seconds to finish off the voting. Um, you know, what Apple does, Apple does great, um, I think. And I'm someone who traditionally hasn't been a big Apple fan, but 
you know, iPads are great, especially I think for like taking notes. I've seen people write on them and they're phenomenal. Um, but they're apples and oranges, right? Like a Surface is genuinely a, uh, a laptop replacement. It's something you can write on, but is, um, you know, you can game on it as well, for example. An iPad, great for taking notes, isn't going to replace a laptop. And then when you get into the MacBook comparison, it is, it is sort of a different thing. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's, it's really, um, yeah, so for me, it's, yeah, surfaces are actually really expensive, Jordan. I absolutely agree. So the department, actually, you guys might have noticed this. Um, I'm actually using a different surface right now than I was, um, actually, I can't remember when I switched them, but I switched them at some point. I had a departmental surface, and then they took it back because somebody needed one, and so I had to buy my own. But um, I have a departmental spending account, so that's why I could justify it. Okay. All right, let's see this, everyone. Uh, oops, no, I do not want to relaunch. I want to share the results. That's pretty evenly distributed, which says to me, we don't know, right? We don't, we don't know what's going on. That's why I like this question. I think that there's a nice lesson um, for us to learn here. So let me, uh, let's go through this. And uh, maybe the, the sadistic voice uh, was dis, uh, deserved. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me kind of rewrite down the question for you so you can see what's going on. Okay. So f of x is equal to, and see, you'll be able to hear my laptop kind of get better in a second and because I've stopped screen sharing. So what is f inverse of one. Okay. Um, actually, you know what, Ovada? Yeah, sure. If you guys want, you could do it. I, I don't think I've given anything away, though. I, I suspect that your classmates <laughs> might be a little bit upset um, that you did it. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Phenomenal. If you guys are into it, I am into it as well. Go crazy. Wait, why did it not, it did not send you guys to breakout rooms. So I'm gonna close all the rooms. We're gonna try that again. Assign automatically. Ah, there we go. Now it's working. Download a different version of Zoom and it works slightly differently. Not sure how you typically did these with uh, Shrishti Tyler, but if you want to give me co-host, I can hop through a few different rooms. That's what we did with uh, TJ. Right. So the weird thing was, I can try and do it. The weird thing is it seems to be Zoom dependent because sometimes a co-host can move and sometimes they can't. Huh. Yeah, it's very weird. But there you go. Give it a shot. Have one student protesting your decision to do breakout rooms. Uh, there's always one. Sarah, I feel like you rarely go, though. You don't really like breakout rooms, I think. <laughs> it's OK. You guys don't have to. I mean, hell, if you guys want, you can put it in the chat here if you want to try and sort it out amongst yourselves and not go on uh, mic or anything. Feel free to do it here. Or you can just sit back, wait for the answer.
Yeah, it can be. It definitely can be awkward. It's, yeah, I wish there was a time when it, it wasn't so bad. You know, it's a different thing when we're in person, like, I, and I think I've mentioned this before, one of the coolest things to do when we're in person is to watch you guys form groups. And so over the year, people will, you know, gather together and then they, you know, you make friends and the friends all sit together. And when you do this as like, a, you know, breakout rooms in person or just talk to the people beside you. And so you already know everyone beside you and you're friends with them and it's not awkward at all. Um, obviously that is a little bit different in an online environment, right? But um, this is definitely something that works better, I think, in person. But that being said, there are some breakout rooms that I think go really, really well. Um, and some that, you know, like you said, are probably a little bit awkward. It obviously kind of depends on the people that you're there with, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get it. You know, that's why I'm not, like I, you know, some people make all of this count for participation marks, but you guys just do what you're comfortable with, right? Like, I think that's okay. I'm not, I'm not super upset about that. But that's just it. So some, some rooms I know are actually really active and some, everyone is quiet and you really have to struggle to get them to talk. Some aren't so bad. And again, the great thing is in person, what I'll do is I'll move around the, yeah, exactly. Some are really loud. In person, I'll move around to the different groups and, you know, even if they're kind of quiet, once I go around to the groups, I'm like, hey guys, how's, how's it going? People immediately just open up because they have all these questions. They're not certain what to do. And I can just go and hang out with them and we get stuff working out. And so it's really, it is too bad that you guys don't get that experience because um, it is different, but no, definitely not. I mean, even look at this class, you know, there's 120 people here. Usually I know a lot of you by your faces, but not so much by names. And ironically, this year it's going to be the opposite. I'm going to know all your names, but not recognize any of you uh, in your faces. I know that in future years, I'm going to be walking around campus and you guys are going to be like, hi, Professor Holden. I'm really, like, I have no idea who you are because <laughs> I've never seen most of your faces before. Um, Right? But that's exactly what it's going to be. <laughs> Whereas usually it's the opposite. I see people, I recognize them, I say hi, but I have no idea what their names are. And so where that's kind of awkward is, is that they will, um, students will ask me for like reference letters. And so they'll send me an email and I'm like, you guys send me a picture, man, because I have no idea what you look like. <laughs> or right, like you, I've got your name, but I don't know what you look like. So they have to send me a picture. So I know I'm like, oh yeah, now I, re now I remember who you are. Um, yeah, we, it's all it's all weird. I you know I gotta say there are definitely I wish I could we could do this in person and that you know uh, I could see you guys in person. But there are there are benefits to doing stuff online. And I know it is a little bit exhausting for you guys, but <laughs> I know it is a little bit exhausting for you guys. But on the one hand, and I, I'm certain I've said this before, there's no doubt in my mind that many of you are much more willing to ask questions in the chat than you would be in class. Exactly, exactly, right? Like I think a lot of you guys um, in class would be much more hesitant to ask questions, but in the chat, many of you are fearless. Like you have no problem just being like, hey, listen, sorry, I didn't understand that, can you go back? Um, and in class, I really have to struggle to bring you guys around. Uh, Olus, don't, don't worry about it. If you guys don't know the answer, we'll cover it in a second. Just do your best, guess uh, the best that you can. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Is our exam online? I think so, yes. Um, and in fact, Rahab, I will fight to have your exam online. And the reason for that, the reason for that is many of you are taking this course in, are international students and are taking this course in your home countries, right? Many of you are in China. I know that some of you are um, in Eastern Europe. Some of you are in other parts of Asia. Exactly. And so, to be like, hey, and exactly the Middle East. And so we're gonna be like, hey y'all, by the way, your exam's in person. I need you all to book flights out here for April. I think that'd be kind of, that's a dick move, right? Um, and yeah, so I don't wanna do that to you. Um, so I would actually fight to have your exam online. And I told my departmental chair, I said, if we're gonna do this online, I want the ability to be able to say that the exam's online as well and to override the university if they say you have to do exams uh, in person, I want to be able to say, no, we're doing it online. That's the only way this is fair. There was, Jacob, there was some consideration back in the early days that if things resolved by April, that they would reinforce having exams in person, because exams are a big deal, right? 
Um, but like I said, I said, I don't think that's fair to my students, especially if we've been doing online tests the entire year to suddenly drop them into an in-person test, incredibly unfair. Um, so I am 99% certain we'll have an online test and I will fight if that 1% somehow happens where the administration says, no, you can't have one, then basically we're going to do it anyway. And I'm going to ask you all not to tell on me, um, but you know, we'll worry about that later. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> all right, everyone, I'm going to have 15 more seconds and we'll take this up. Okay, so it looks like, <coughs> yeah, yeah, some, some universities are doing that. You know, U of T has a institutional policies that we have to have final exams. I don't know, maybe it's crazy, maybe it's not. But in math, it does kind of make sense as well. But we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, okay, so as you guys can see in the results, we're kind of getting away from A and C. We've got more emphasis towards B and D. Unfortunately, last time we actually had consensus, like a plurality on D, more people thought D was correct. Um, and then we move towards, after the breakout rooms, we move towards uh, um, B, but no, turns out, correct? Oh yeah, no, sorry, B is the correct answer. I was looking at the wrong answers. Uh, yeah, correct answer is B. All right, so let's take it up. Let's see why. Does anyone remember what, what, is, what does the inverse do? What's the definition of the inverse? So there's a couple of ways of doing this. Yeah, okay, so Stephanie, that's a great answer. You switch X and Y, or if you want, you switch inputs, right? Okay, yeah, that works as well. Yeah, so exactly. So there's actually two ways that you can think about the function. I know that I think many of you learned that the inverse is you kind of switch X and Y, right? And there's ways that that's true. There's ways that that's false. What you can think about it, though, is that the output becomes the input. What I'm saying is, look, if this function, if I plug in a number 7 and I output the number 10, the inverse takes in the number 10 and outputs the number 7, OK? It, it flips the, um, the input and the output. So one way we can do this, the inverse flips the input and output, right? So what we're saying there is that if if y is equal to f of x, then f inverse of y is equal to x, OK? So if you give me the output and plug that into the inverse function, it produces the input for you, OK? So what we want is we want to say, so we want f inverse of 1, right? So that means that we want to figure out, we want to figure out what x is, right? All right, these are the same thing. If we want f inverse of 1, what we're asking is, what number can I plug into f that results in an output of 1? Yeah, this is the second poll question. OK, is everyone, is everyone OK about with that? Right, do you see if y is equal to f of x, f inverse of y is equal to x? So if I want f inverse of 1, I'm trying to figure out what number do I plug into f to get 1 out. Does that make sense? Everyone OK? OK. OK. So we're trying to figure out what number can I plug into this function in order to get the number 1 out. Uh, well, no, no, Mana, what we want is we want the value of x. Right, like so. The answer here isn't x itself, but we want to know which number x gives me one. So let's come up here. Let's look at the function f of x. Okay, can you just by inspection? Okay, don't do any solving. Just if you were to guess a number and plug it in, choose the easiest numbers you can to start off. Do you see what number can I plug in f that produces the number one? Yeah, x equals zero seems to work, right? So 
Um, since, so if I plug zero in, what do I get? I get zero cubed plus zero plus one. That's equal to one. So since f of zero is equal to one, right? The inverse interchanges x and y. We know f inverse of one is equal to zero. Does that make sense, right? It just flips x and y. Everyone okay with that? So when I ask you, what is f inverse of one? What I'm saying is, what number do I plug in f in order to get one out? Yeah, okay, so that's the idea there. I think what some of you might have tried to do and how we deliberately can, okay, so hey, some, are you saying you wanna interchange x and y and then try and solve for y as a function of x? And then, and then, then you just plug in one? Right, so I deliberately made it so you couldn't do that in this question. Um, generally, like if this question you could do it, then totally, absolutely, that would be a legitimate thing where you actually like determine what the inverse function is and then just plug in one. That would totally work out. But this question was deliberately designed that that is actually very hard. Okay. Yeah, exactly. The inverse function is really nasty to try and find. So, and that's a general rule. Okay. You can know that an inverse function exists. And in fact, the inverse function could be theoretically very nice. It could be continuous, it could be differentiable, it could have all the nice properties that you want, but it turns out to be really, really hard to write down. Um, and so what we want, what I want to show you with this example in particular is that it's possible to still figure out the values of the inverse function without needing to actually compute the inverse function, right? If you know something about the original function, then you know something about the inverse function without having to actually be able to compute it. Yeah, so exactly, Sarah, the answer is zero. Okay, now you guys can try and, and do the reversal and, and, and compute what the inverse function is. You can give that a shot, but it is quite it is quite tricky to do. Okay, it's very nasty. So that was actually kind of the lesson that we wanted you to be able to take from that. It's just to remember what is the definition of the inverse function and, uh, and can I use that to help? Okay, let's try another one. Here's gonna be one that I think is going to look a little bit difficult, but really isn't that bad. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, so already so values. many people, so many people are saying the, the wrong thing look, look, immediately. Look at the values on the graph. Yeah, you guys are just going way too fast. Look at so each of those things is one right? Um, somebody tell me, before you guys go crazy, what is f of 2? What is the value of f of 2? You, you, okay, stop. You, got, you people are still answering. Stop. <laughs> Jordan, can you see the poll? Yeah. Okay. Okay, everyone, look at the chat. Thank you, everyone who is saying this. The value of f of 2 is 4. Now, <laughs> for those of you I want you to double check with the function that you just chose whether f of two is equal to four. <laughs> all right, all right, everyone. Okay, you know what? Stop, 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 stop. I'm gonna relaunch the poll because I think a lot of people got a little, I'm sorry, I, I, you can vote again. I think a lot of people got burned there. And uh, to be fair, the shape does look exactly like It does like look that. like x cubed. It does. Absolutely, it does. Mm -hmm. Had the same thing happen in TJ's, uh, just not to this extent. <laughs> Had to attend his lecture one last time. Everyone was sad. <laughs> Did you go today? Yep. Okay. All right. So that that's good. So I, I restarted the poll, and it looks like we're back where we left off when I restarted. Only this time, fewer people um, have kind of made that commitment, which is great. But yeah, okay. I want you all to be careful. This looks like one of these functions. A lot of you kind of jumped the gun and we're like, oh yeah, it's definitely this, but it, it's not definitely that. It's just. 
As someone who's taken uh, Tyler's courses before, I'm just going to say if there actually are numbers on a graph rather than just like a blank graph with a sketch on it, there's probably a reason for it. That's true. Because actually, originally when I drew this graph, I was like, I'm not going to put the, the, the lines in. And then I realized if I don't put the lines in, you actually can't tell what the right answer is. Um, so I put the lines in. Yeah, I mean, odd power and symmetry, absolutely. Um, this does have the symmetry. This, I mean, this is an odd function, right? It just probably doesn't look like it when you look at the function, but it is an odd function, yeah. Okay, so we're at 86%. Maybe let's do another 30 seconds or so. Finish that off. Okay, so sharing the results, overwhelmingly A, not as much as I would have liked A, but I don't think, I think if we go to breakout rooms, most of you will just do A anyway. A is the correct answer here, so it is X times the absolute value of X, okay? I oh, know, that's, that's awesome, right? Like sometimes, and, and that's a great lesson that I really want you to internalize, is that if you don't get the answer right away, that's totally okay. Sometimes you have to stare at it for a bit to get it. And that's important. A lot of people, I think, um, if they don't get the answer right away, kind of give up. And you've just kind of demonstrated to yourself that like, hey, listen, if you stare at it for long enough, you can get it, right? And that's phenomenal. That's a great lesson to have. Okay, uh, so um, let me kind of resketch for you roughly it. I'm not gonna kind of like fill in the lines of everything. But let me uh, roughly give you what we had. So it looks something like this, right? Y equals f of x, whatever it is. Now, a lot of you, a lot of people jumped the gun and was like, oh, it's x cubed, because it looks like x cubed, right? It does. Uh, can you? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people were like, oh, hey, it looks like x cubed and just jumped the gun and wrote down x cubed. But as soon as I pointed out, oh, hey, it's, it can't be x cubed because you know when you look at it, you're able to tell that, oh, look, f of 2 equals 4, f of negative 2 is negative 4, right? Oops, negative 4. Um, so a lot of you figured out it wasn't x cubed. Um, and then if you take Haysom's uh, advice and realize, hey, it can't be b, it can't be c, b and c are both always positive. Uh, and it can't be D, process of elimination is A. So that's not, that's not too bad, right? If you just process of elimination it. Now, the other thing you can do, um, and this is something that I want to show you because I think that this is useful. Ah, yeah, exactly, which is what, what Jordan is doing. So yeah, let's open it to the class first. Um, if you wanted to write this as a piecewise function, what would you do? Okay, yeah, well, it's absolutely. But what do you, so what do you do when x is less than zero? So Chi Feng, you have it when x is positive. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So everyone, what do we do when x is negative? Exact, uh, no, your negative's in the wrong spot. Yeah, you don't, because you don't want one over x squared, right? So to get this, yeah, exactly, perfect, there you go. So to get this, does anyone remember, what is the piecewise definition of the absolute value? Sure. So the absolute value of x is equal to uh, just x if x, let's say, greater than or equal to 0 here. And what do we do if x is less than 0? What is the absolute value of x? Exactly. Perfect. It's negative x. 
Okay, now I am certain that many of you are very upset by what I just wrote down. And you should definitely say something. I'm, let's talk about it anyway. But all right, Kevin, so let's, I don't want you to worry about the graph at all. Okay, let's kind of, let's do something new. Let's just talk about the absolute value of X. So the idea is the absolute value of X is X if X is greater than zero and negative X if X is less than zero. And let's talk about that for a second. So I think the way a lot of you have internalized the absolute value is to say that, oh, the absolute value always outputs the positive version of a number, right? So the absolute value of negative seven is positive seven. And the absolute value of five is just five because it's already positive. Does that sound right? I think that's how a lot of people internalize it. Okay. So, but mathematically, that's not a great definition to work with because how do you say, take the positive portion of the number? I guess that's in terms of the absolute value, but that seems rather circular. Um, yeah, okay, sure, yeah. But, so the way that we're actually gonna do this, so what I've written here is the mathematical definition of the absolute value. And you might be going, wait a second, we know that the absolute value is always greater than or equal to zero, but you've put a minus sign in here how does that make any sense at all, right? That's, that's nonsense. But look at, look at the condition, okay? Look at the condition. We're only going to put a minus sign in front of the x if x is already negative. And when you take the negative of a negative number, what do you get? Positive number, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So let's give this a shot, right? So let's say, let's let x be negative eight, right? So when I take the absolute value of X, well, let me just write that. That's the absolute value of negative eight. Now, because X is less than zero, according to the, the piecewise definition above, I'm gonna put out negative X, right? But remember, X is negative eight. Right? And that gives you the positive version. So what I want you to do is I want you to stare at this piecewise function and realize what it's saying. So it says, if x is already greater than or equal to 0, don't do anything. Right? The absolute value of that number is just itself. It's already greater than or equal to 0. If that number is less than 0, then put another minus sign in front of it to now make it positive. Right? Does that kind of make sense? And in fact, I think you guys, here's another way of seeing this. You guys know what the graph of the absolute value looks like, right? You know, it looks like this. Well, this is y equals x, right? When x is greater than zero, let's say greater than or equal to, this is y equals negative x, right? x less than zero, like that. Yeah, exactly, right? So it's that v. So you can see it's negative x when x is negative, and it's just y equals x when x is greater than or equal to zero, right? So the piecewise definition of the absolute value is x when x is greater than zero, and yeah, exactly, and negative x when x is less than, or, uh, less than zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, don't forget, one of them has to be uh, an equal. You can put it in a less than if you want to, because obviously the absolute value of zero is zero, but yeah. Yes, yes, Stephanie, you can, but when you're doing um, things with the absolute, so that works, Stephanie, if you're working with an individual point, like if you're working with the absolute value of negative eight, you can totally just write eight. But the problem is, is that when we're working with the absolute value function, we kind of need to be able to account for both what happens when it's negative and positive at the same time. And this piecewise definition is definitely going to be the thing that saves us. Okay, so if we're ever working with the absolute value function, that thing at the top of the screen is definitely what you want to keep in mind. Okay, so now the function that you were originally given was f of x is x times the absolute value of x, right? But we know the absolute value of x is x when you're greater than zero and negative x if x is less than zero. So let's just multiply. I'm going to write this in a weird way. This is not normally how we would do this uh, if x is less than zero, right? And you can just multiply the x through. So that's going to give you x squared if x is greater than or equal to zero, and negative x squared if x is less than zero, 
right? And that's that graph that we had, right? The one that looked like, you guys all thought it kind of looked like the, cube, uh, the cubed function, but really it was half of the x squared term. And then the second half of the x squared term, but this time kind of you took it and you flipped it in the x-axis so it was pointing downwards instead of pointing upwards, right? And so that's actually what that function is. It's just x squared when x is greater than zero, but it's negative x squared when x is less than zero, okay? Yeah, yeah, it is kind of wacky. And that's kind of, that's specifically why I gave it to you because I want you to see a lot of students see that and think that that function is really badly behaved, right? So they'll see an absolute value and they assume that it kind of has a corner, but this actually doesn't have a corner on it, right? It actually kind of smooths out nicely at zero and does everything without kind of, you know, having a corner on it. Um, so students see that absolute value and kind of assume that that's going to be there, but it turns out not. And then not only that, it's a piecewise function, but actually it looks really nice, right? Like it's not, it's not this sort of ugly thing. So, you know, there was a reason why I wanted to show that too, because this thing does have the potential to come up. Um, and it, this is how we deal with that absolute value, right? We, we put it into its piecewise form and uh, attack it that way. Okay. And I really, I cannot emphasize that lesson enough. Right. I do. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, piecewise comes up in real life all the time where, you know, you just have you, your function just changes completely and differently, especially if you can't nicely describe what it is that it does. Uh, a piecewise function is a, a nice way of doing that. Right. But where? Uh, I don't know. If you were to, my examples are mostly like engineering and physics. So I don't have a great deal of examples from that, but maybe Jordan will have some more. No, like it's, yeah, sure, there you go. Certain demand functions in economics. So if you want to take that as a thing, um, definitely they show up a lot in, like in, in any physics or engineering as well. Like they come up a fair amount, yeah. Okay, so um, one thing that I really want to emphasize, I do want you to take a couple lessons from today that inverse kind of, that you can deal with the inverse without having to compute it. But the other big one I want you to take, anytime you have to deal with an absolute value, you want to go to this piecewise definition, okay? This one at the top of the screen here. This is going to save your life. Don't try and fight it, okay? If you have to deal with an absolute value function, that's usually the way to do it, okay? Not 100% not of the time, but that's always a safe, a sure thing is that definition. Um, and if you try and get around it and not use it just because you don't, like piecewise functions, whatever the case is, you could be in for a rough time. Okay, so I want you to get familiar with that and try to internalize that as the definition of the absolute value function um, instead of just saying, I'm just going to take the number and make it positive. Okay, because that's really hard to work with mathematically. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal, uh, Addy, if that, if that just happened to you. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, can always give you trig. I mean, I personally, I love trig functions. I think, uh, I think they're really a lot of fun. But I'm a mathematician, so maybe that's a. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I only really hate don't trig know. integration, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be, it could be trig integration. Again, I it really doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't have trig, and actually, economics and management really tried to nail that home. They're like, yeah, we really don't want you to do any trig. And I think everyone hates trig um, heck because of all the identities. I think it's it's just there's so many identities that you have to remember. And most of them boil down to just remembering what the graph of sine and cosine look like, but and, and the Pythagorean identity, but you know, yeah, I love them. I love them for sure. Um, so about our our lecture is actually done. Um, I often always run a little bit late, but yeah, of course, everyone, thanks for coming out. It's good to see you all again. Hopefully that wasn't too bad, but uh, we'll, we'll start on limits when we get to Thursday, okay? So make sure there weren't any videos for this. Make sure you do the videos, though, and the readings um, for Thursday, and then we'll start to talk about limits then, okay? No problem, everyone. It's good seeing you, and I'll see you on Thursday. And again, for any of you who want to hang out a bit and ask any questions, I'll hang around. Sorry, Prof, just a quick question. Thursday is when we actually start our new videos, right? That's right, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, hi, Prof. I have hey. a quick question. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, so question two: If you were asked to uh to determine the inverse of the function, yeah, uh, of x, what would that be? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I specifically chose this one because it was very hard to find. Uh, there oh. is a cubic equation or a cubic formula, just like the quadratic formula. I, I suspect yeah. we might not need it in this case, but you could always do it that way. Um, the, the reality is, is that there are lots of functions whose inverses are actually nearly impossible, if not impossible to find. Okay. So, can, so in that case, uh, is, is the correct way to do it? Is it we just uh, replace x with y, and then we single out y? Yes. In that case, if you, if you were to do it, that is how you would do it. Okay. Next week, uh, test will be this week's material or the one for the break. Uh, let's see. So it's going to be next Friday. So technically, anything from this week is examinable, examinable on the next test. But there isn't much from this week, right? There's the functions and then the limits that we're going to do on Thursday. So there isn't too much, but it's mostly going to be last term. Number six from the homework. From, from what homework? Uh, Saif, email me. Uh, yeah, that's fine. You can just email me. So, uh, Olus, which um, number six from what? Which I'm assuming homework? he means exercise six from chapter one, since that's the relevant practice. Ah, uh, I see. Six from chapter one. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Let me just pull that up. Ah, okay, sure. So what's the definition of an even function? Exactly, perfect. So a function is even if f of negative x equals f of x. All right. So let's do A2. Yeah. So we'll do, we'll do odd, or maybe we could, yeah, let's keep them both. You're right. Let's keep them both uh, in front of us because we don't know which is going to give us which if f of negative x equals negative f of x, like that. Okay. So in A2, we know that f is even and g is odd. Right? And we want to look at the function fg. So what we're going to do, notice kind of the thing that's common to both of them is this negative x term, right? So basically, if you want to determine whether a function is even, odd, potentially neither, what you want to do is you want to evaluate it at negative x and see what happens. See how, Luke? OK, so does that make sense? So let's plug negative x into this function. So that gives me f of negative x times g of negative x like that. All right, does that make sense? OK. And now you know what f of negative x is, right? So that's just f of x. And then you know what g of negative x is? It's negative g of x. So in total, you get negative f of x g of x. That's negative f of g of x. Right? And if you look at the beginning, and you look at the end, is f, uh, nope. Right, yeah, odd. Right? So you plugged in negative x, and you got it the same function, but it's negative, right? Now, some of these, though, the answer is neither, all right? So some of these, um, 
The answer is neither. And in the case of a neither function, what you want to do is you want to produce counterexamples. Okay. And you want to say, oh, look, here is um, um, an example of an even and odd function. And when I add them, I, I get something which is neither even nor odd. Right. Um, so with neither, just give, give me counterexamples. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, you're right. It is. Uh, so I guess I'm doing B, not A. But you're right. But you can see now how you would have done A, right? Is the G of negative X would have just become G, G of X, and you would have gotten an even question. Yeah. OK, so does that make sense? You kind of see how to do the rest? Okay, great. Mm. Yeah, it's going to be tough if you're visualizing, especially I think with the composition. That, that one's going to be tough if you're just visualizing it. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. You know, there's definitely a time when the visualization is important and can give you a lot of insight. But just like with the absolute value, there's a time when you really want to go back and look at what the algebraic definition is. And, and it's often when you're trying to show something, it's often easier to work with the algebra. Right then with the geometry. But the geometry is good for intuition. Okay, anyone else? No problem, Chifeng. All right, everyone, I'm going to assume, because the chat's fairly quiet. Um, OK, sure. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Well, what question? So conditional probability and uh, poll questions. Old test. Oh, OK, let me pull it up. Maybe I said which it was in nine. Roll D six. Right, so this is the week eleven polls. Q nine. So what we want to do is roll. A D six. Uh, X is the number that appears. And then Y is the number of heads that appear when you flip uh, X coins. Number of heads when flip X coins. Okay, compute. The probability x equals six, given that y equals five. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it is an old test question, um, and it really kind of screams to me Bayes theorem, right? So we could compute the probability that y equals five, given x equals six. Okay, great. Yeah. So we're doing it. So we can compute the probability that y equals 5 given x equals 6. This is the natural thing to do, right? Say, if I flip a coin six times, what's the probability that I get five heads, right? OK. So the you guys tell me. So what is the probability that you get five heads given that you flipped a coin six times? Uh, yeah, OK, yep. Yeah. So 6 choose 1, which is 6, divided by 2 to the 6, absolutely. All right, let me just kind of, I would write that. But of course, mathematically, it's the same thing. OK, so that's the probability of that. Now, the question is asking you this weird thing where you're kind of switching the conditionals. And that's a big hint to you that you should use Bayes' theorem. So by Bayes' theorem, 
right? So I'm going to actually have to rederive Bayes' theorem because I never just remember it. So that would be the probability that x equals 6 and the probability that y equals 5. Why did I write that? Yes, times the probability that y equals 5. Uh, oops. Uh, I am still recording. I'm sure lots of people will want to know this as well. Um, okay, and then the probability that x equals 6 and y equals 5, so that's going to be the probability that y, e, why do I keep writing e, x equals 6 times the probability that x equals 6 divided by the probability that y equals 5. Okay, so I'm just rederiving Bayes' theorem, but you can go straight to here if you want. Okay, so does that make sense? Right, that's what Bayes' theorem tells you, right? The probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Okay? Now, we've computed this, right? And we know what the probability that x equals 6 is, so what we need is the probability that y equals 5. Is everyone okay with that? Everyone keeping up? Okay, so right, we just computed this thing, and the probability that x equals 6 is just 1 sixth. Uh, y is heads? Y yes, y is the uh, probability that you get five heads, yeah. So that's the hard part, right? Actually, in this part, in, in applying Bayes' theorem, this is the hard part. At least in my opinion, it's the hard part. Because we know, we need to ask ourselves, what's the probability that we got five heads. So the probability that we get five heads, well, it exactly, it depends. Exactly. So probably that you get five heads depends on how many coins you flipped. But there's only uh, two answers that you could have done, right? You either flipped five heads or, or sorry, you either fit, flipped five coins or you flipped six coins, right? Because you rolled a D6 and that determined uh, a six-sided dice to determine how many coins you were going to flip. So the maximum number of coins you could flip was only six, right? So you can say, well, what is the probability that you flip five uh, heads? on five flips, right? That's one over two to the five times the probability that x equals five. Well, that's just one sixth. And then you could say the probability that y equals five, given that x equals six, we just computed that, right? That was six over two to the six times the probability that x equals six. Yeah, there you go. And so we have all the numbers now, right? So you just have to plug everything in and see what the answer is. So does that make sense? Yeah. We scaffolded it a little bit more. So part one was, I think, to, you know, part one was find this thing. And part two was find this thing. And then part three was find this thing. So it was a three part question and you had to do each of those parts separately. Um, but right, if you did those two correctly and then applied base there and part three wasn't too bad. Yeah, yeah. So it was, right, like we scaffold, we, we didn't expect a student to go straight there. That was tough. Um, but we scaffolded it out so that it wasn't too bad. Okay. A big, like I said, a big hint for, OK, perfect. But remember, a big hint that, that Bayes' theorem is going to be used is if you're computing the condition, the, the opposite conditional probability than the natural one. So like I said, the probability of y being 5 given that x is 6, that's the easy one to compute, right? 
What's the probability to get five heads on six coins? But so because it's the weird one, that's the big hint to you that it's the base, it's base theorem, right? Because base theorem tells you how to compute the flipped one. So use that as a hint. Okay, perfect. Without base theorem, I mean, in theory, you could, you could try and do this. Yeah, I think it's pretty complicated. You could try to enumerate that set, right? The, the hard part about that thing I circled in red, pink there is x equals six and the intersection of y equals five. That's a pretty hard set to enumerate. Um, you can do it and you can try and hopefully it works out. Um, but the whole thing about Bayes' theorem is that it actually makes this computation easier. Um, it might be a little bit unintuitive at first, but it does make the computation easier, which is why it is a result. Right, intersection doesn't care. You can do them in any order. No problem, see you later. All right, everyone else, if you have any last minute questions, be sure to throw them up. Otherwise, I think we can call it a night. It was a pretty good session, I think, for our first time back. Um, Okay, I don't see anything. Uh, so I'm gonna call it everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, like I said, it was good to see you all and hopefully you had a good break and I will see you Thursday.